is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Magician's Apprentice, chapters 43, 44, 45, 46, and 47. In these chapters, so the Karelians are starting to be pretty fucking shady. And it appears that the king is perfectly willing to let it be done in his name as long as there's somebody who's a tiny bit crazy there to do it. Ooh, we're walking down a weird path now. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. First of all, thank you very much to Ashley for commissioning this book. Um, Ashley, yeah, I'm feeling like I really don't know where we're going now because, you know, I was really concerned in the first half of this book with how racist it felt the author was being in terms of having like the community filled with people of color be the ones that were also like slavers and just like, you know, having really regressive attitude towards women and generally being seen even by their own people as being like terrible. It's kind of funny now. I'm not sure whether or not I actually believe that what she set up in the first half of the book is borne out right now. Because my issue is that Hanara meets Tessia and is like thinking to himself how like she was so much kinder and gentler than anybody that he would meet in Sachaka. And now we're like meeting a lot of people who are Sachakan who seem like they're much more decent than the folks that we have met previous. And I find it strange that it, that Hanara had this response to Tessia after meeting so many other folks from Stara's POV that are also not terrible. I am unsure whether or not to put that down to the author, just wanting us to like think a certain thing and kind of doing whatever she needed to do to get us on board with that and how much of it I should just be like, well, Hanara won't have met everybody in Sachaka. So, you know, I'm sure that he has his ideas of what everybody is like, but he also is ruled by a particular master and he won't have gotten a chance necessarily to like, you know, mingle with too many other people. And I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of on the fence with this because you could easily say, no, he doesn't know everybody in Sachaka. Martin's here. Hi, Martin. Um, he doesn't know everybody in Sachaka. Sure. But it did feel like he was being placed by the author as a like stand in and spokesperson for the country of Sachaka, if that makes sense. Sorry, this sun is killing me right here. I'm like, let me put something up here to sort of block it. Don't know if this will work. Um, there we go. That's better. But yeah, so I, I feel sort of weird about it. You know, part of me is like, cool. I'm really glad that it turns out this is a fucked up thing to say, but I'm, I'm glad it's turning out that the Karelians seem to be uh, in part just as terrible as the Sachakans are. On the other hand, I'm like, I don't know how much I really buy it because the Karelians don't have like the institutionalized, you know, same sort of problems. Um, but it's too complicated an issue to really be able to like draw a definitive line it's the same sort of thing. It's like, yeah, maybe in the United States, it's not like uh, women aren't treated as poorly as they are in some, you know, in Saudi Arabia or India, you know, but we're not 
not treated super great either. It's allegedly we have the same rights, but it, like multiple studies prove that we are not paid as much, that rape allegations are not taken seriously or followed up on, that there are like thousands of rape kits across the country, hundreds of thousands that have never been tested. So it's the kind of thing where it's like, yeah, maybe in like in writing, we have a distinct advantage and privilege, but in practice, the views of us are very similar as they are in other countries. We just kind of have a little bit more recourse. And I say a little bit purposefully. So anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, these chapters, chapter 43 starts off with the Kirillian army and the invasion and the whole way that this is going down with Tessia and the way that she's watching what's happening around her and interpreting it and judging it. Um, and there is just a, a vibe that she can't shake that they are not doing the right thing. And I really appreciate the fact that it's not like Tessia is wholly against this plan. It's not like she's like, no, we mustn't. And they're simply ignoring her. It's not as if she's like, I can't believe what I'm seeing. It's a slow burn of like, I get why they want to do this, but I don't know. This just, just does not settle with me. Ah, I don't know what to think about this. And then it begins to ramp up while she's still over here deciding how she feels about it. And I think that's a much fairer representation of what it is like to be a citizen of a community that is involved with something that is underhanded and dishonest and cruel. Many Americans will probably understand what I'm talking about here. You begin to hear things and you like, at first you're kind of like, no, we wouldn't do that. And then you start to be like, oh my God, are we doing that? Wait, hold on. And as we're going, hold on, I need more information. That shit is off and running, has taken on its own whole fucking identity and has a driver's license and has matured and owns two condos now. And we're still over here like, wait, is this happening? And it's, it's, it has been happening. Get fucking on board or get off. And I, I think that that is just the natural progression of what happens when you're dealing with unthinkable choices, when you're trying to decide whether or not you want X group of people to die or Y group of people to die. And it feels like that's, there's no good choice here. There's nothing that I can pick that makes me feel good about what I'm choosing and that is how war tricks you into doing terrible, terrible things that feel justified at the time. And it's just like, you know, I, I, I feel for Tessia a lot here. I don't blame her at all for not seeing this coming because why would she? There are other people around her who also have the same misgivings she does. Giant comes back and he is not like he's shook. He does not like this. He confines to Dakin what happened. And Dakin is not on board with any of this at all. So it's not that she's alone in her thinking, but they are all so busy chewing over the morality of it, that action is happening that they aren't prepared to like make a, make a choice definitively on in one way or another, in one direction or another. And um, this leads to complicity. And that's the part that I think folks have the hardest time like grasping is that you don't need to have endorsed a thing. You don't need to have actively participated in a thing. But if you were around and letting it happen, you need to admit you were complicit in it, regardless of your reasons for not stopping it. And those reasons might be perfectly valid. If you are not actively struggling against it in any way, 
because you're afraid for yourself, you're afraid for your family, whatever, those are valid reasons. That does not change your complicity. And the most I can say this section is that Giant and Dakin do fight against it a little bit in finding a group of people hidden in like a secret hidey hole in a jar in the pantry and not turning them in, which I really like. I am, I feel like is kind of as good as they are managing to do and not be cut out of everything that's going on because Dakin's sort of arguing. I, th- I think his argument is, you know, if I actively protested, if I said, no, I'm not doing this. I don't think we should be doing this. These are the orders of the king. You know, this is not a democracy here. This isn't the king says a thing. That thing happens. If you do not fall in line, you are a traitor. And I believe that Dakin's interest lies in, I want to at least still be involved in the decision making. And they will cut me out of the loop entirely unless I play along at least a little. And if I'm at least in the loop, I can argue for slightly more humane measures to be taken here and there. I can argue for less damage to be done here and there. Again, it is a really tricky line. And this is sort of what happens, I think, when, uh, you know, when people become police, for example. The police, that organization, and I say that organization, even though every community is going to be different, but without fail, there are, quote, bad apples who are able to get away with shit because other people know if they rock the boat too much, they will be kicked off of it. And so it leads to a culture of side eye and that's it. There is very little actual consequence or condemnation that come from within the ranks. There are people who join thinking that they are going to change things from the inside and rapidly begin to realize if they actually attempted to make any of those changes, they would lose the position of power that they have allegedly to make the changes in the first place. So then you get a chicken and egg situation. And most of the time people opt to keep their power and not risk it because they've built a life based on this, you know, this career And they don't want to lose everything that they have built and worked for. Again, it's valid and an understandable reason for wanting to keep what you have. But it still makes you complicit in the things that you help in covering up, in minimizing, in whatever. So this it's a really interesting thing to see all of this happening from Tessia's perspective. Because she is like thinking to herself, um, invasion is wrong. It makes us the aggressor. It makes us more like the Sachakans, less certain we are better than them. Yet I also can't help thinking we would have to do far worse to be as cruel and immoral as they. Perhaps the harm we do will be balanced by the good. We could make Sachaka a better place. We could end slavery for good. It's going to come at a cost. It's going to change the way we see ourselves. How much are we willing to restrain ourselves in order to be right and moral? If we justify this, then how much easier will it be to justify worse? If Kirelians believe a little wrongdoing is excusable for the right reason, what else will we excuse or assume others will excuse? And these are the big questions. I mean, the thing is that we want to end slavery for good, is again, one of those things that like the idea of ending slavery is really easy to say and easy to point out and be like, this is a good thing. But in practice, simply ending slavery without any real understanding of the culture behind it, the economy behind it, and not replacing it with anything, that is not a recipe for success. You cannot simply do away with an entire system And not have an enormous safety net underneath everyone to basically 
ah, what's the word I want? To, ugh, I can't remember the word. Well, basically to counter it. You need something there that is going to work in the opposite direction and help support what you are trying to like take apart. You can't just, you know, you can't fix a wall by completely knocking that wall down and building a new wall. That's not fixing the wall. That's just destroying a thing and making something that you like better in its place. And while that is something that they could choose to do, that is a very different thing than what they're claiming they want to do, which is fix a thing. It sounds, the more you hear them talk, like what they're really interested in doing is like kind of like colonizing. And I say colonizing with the understanding that when we talk about colonizing in a modern perspective, we are often talking about a uh, a sort of predatory culture that has much greater firepower and much greater um, uh, resources at its disposal coming in and completely uprooting a country or civilization that does not stand any chance of defending itself. That's not exactly the case here because Sachaka is in a position where it can defend itself to a degree, whether they win or not, that's up in the air, but they are more evenly matched. Um, but it does feel like the Kirelians do kind of want to just undo Sachaka and make Kirelia 2.0 out here. And I don't really know how much respect they would have for the fact that while you may not agree with slavery, what about the rest of the culture? How about preserving any of that? You know, um, Martin says related fact, when the UK freed all its slaves in 1833, it cost 40% of the entire government's yearly income. It ain't easy or cheap. This is exactly it. The United States. I mean, it was a bad, bad scene guys. If we're looking at what happened right after slavery ended, basically what we got was like slavery light where it was essentially the exact same fucking thing with a new name and a pretend pay check that went with it. Sharecropping was like, we're going to lie to you and tell you that you'll be able to get out of this and you aren't ever going to be able to get out of this. So yeah, you're still a slave, but we're just going to like say that you're not a slave, but you really definitely are though. And that is something that like is still continuing on into the present with the, our, our prison system and the way that that all works. We are, have legalized slavery as long as those people are prisoners. So what do we do? We make sure that the people who escaped slavery when we decided to make it officially illegal are still being imprisoned and made to be slaves. It's just that we'll trump up charges to get them arrested is the thing. We will just make it so that, oh, it's so mysterious. So many more people of color are getting arrested than white people for the same types of crimes. It's just, I guess, because black folks are much more prone to be criminals. It couldn't possibly be because we would like to have free labor and have found a loophole to exploit in order to get it. And, you know, like, I, again, I understand the impulse of being like slavery bad and slavery. Yeah, duh. But you, in, in the actual practice of the thing, cannot just be like, okay, guys, you're free. Uh, I guess leave. These people had households that they lived in that were completely dependent on their labor to run and do not have any provisions in place to pay these people a wage. And you also have people who are loyal to the families that they worked for. And what I find to be kind of key here is that these are slaves that are like, they, you can tell our slaves based on how they are dressed, their build and the way they carry themselves, the uh, quality of like probably the their age, like as they age, I'm sure if you have more money, it's true everywhere that you look better. You have better like health coverage. You have whatever. So it's an interesting thing because the slaves in Sachaka aren't of a different color. They're not like you can, you know, see them walking by if you are not of the culture. 
and instantly know. You have to look for markers. You have to look for where they stand. You have to look for at what they're wearing. But because the racial thing isn't exactly a part of the equation here, it leads to a strange sense of like, I think that probably existed only a little in the United States, but it leads to a strange sense of like, um, of loyalty that I'm not sure would have been here the same way. Um, because there isn't a dividing line that is so easy to point to. These are people that in some cases seem to see themselves as part of the family in a way, or as part of a grand plan to help certain people. I mean, that's certainly how Hanara sees himself as sort of like vital to Takato and also as part of this like grand plan that Takato participated in. So he believes until he is kind of, schooled on that um so hanara you know he was given the choice to be free and he went back because he was like afraid and the key here is when we think about like oh yeah well he was afraid that this guy was going to come after him yeah why would that not be something that you would be afraid of even if slavery were officially made illegal people can still come after you whether or not it's legal really has nothing to do with anything. They just have to know that they can get away with it. And you don't have, if you are a slave, much in terms of recourse to hold somebody responsible, you know? So it's just, I don't know. There's a lot that I feel these people aren't considering, or if they are, it's conveniently not being talked about because it's extremely complicated and nobody really wants to fucking cope with that part. What Tessia winds up, coming to the conclusion of is that it is mostly vengeance that they are trying to make it seem like they are doing this for the benefit of these people. And really they just want to prove their superiority and they want to get revenge. And that's kind of it. Like they can dress it up in whatever paper they want, paint it, whatever color they want underneath. That's what it is. I think Tessie is fucking definitely on the right track there. Um, so this is when Giant comes back and they had apparently him and um, the other magicians who went with Narvellan, they all had agreed that they would uh, drain the slaves of power to power themselves up, but leave the slaves um, exhausted and unable to move so that they couldn't pursue them so that they couldn't fight them. And that was their intention to do this and then ride on. But what, Narvellan does is he comes back and is just like, look, they're going to have her gain enough strength in just a couple of hours to go tell on us. They can't be left alive. And everybody sort of balks at this. So Narvellan goes and kills them himself in order to keep them from having to shoulder the responsibility of having done this. That right there to me is a real stroke of brilliance on Narvellan's part because it is a lot easier to protest somebody doing something to you and forcing people to commit murder, forcing them when you have previously agreed that you were going to handle it one way, making them do something else. You're going to get a lot more protest about that because they are going to feel the guilt and shame in a very different way. But if you take it out of their hands entirely and you're like, look, this needs to be done. It's not pretty. I don't blame me for not wanting to do it. Just let me do it. You don't even have to worry about it. That's that insidious shit, guys. That's the part you got to really fucking watch out for. And it is true of so much out there. There is so There are so many aspects of our lives that when it comes down to it, it's Look, I know this is terrible. Just don't think about it. We're dealing with it. You don't have to worry about it. Just don't think about it. I mean, wage exploitation, labor exploitation, um, animal cruelty and rights, the way that we uh, treat immigrants with, you know, just harvesting our food and the prices that we pay for things that are coming from other countries, sweatshops and what, like there are a million places 
where it just comes down to don't think about it. And I'm not trying to lay blame on consumers exclusively for this, because the thing is, that's how capitalism is meant to work, is that we are also in positions where we don't have a lot of choices because we are also oppressed because wages have stagnated. So we are like kind of shoved into a position in a corner where it's support companies that have these practices or starve. But, you know, this is, that's as close of an example as I can get to something that we every day sort of have to make a choice to turn away from and not look at. And I have to admit, it still shocks me that people don't raise a hue and cry after this incident. Giant comes back and shares what happened with Dakin, but neither of them is like, oh, we are going to go fucking say something about this. Instead, they stop and look at the fact that Narvellan is riding next to the king and smiling. And when Tessia asks how many slaves, I got to say, guys, I thought she was going to say like 20. I thought she was going to say maybe like 30. It was over a hundred. A hundred slaves. These are the people that were like, oh yeah, it'll be great. We'll flee, we'll free the slaves. But first we'll kill a hundred of them. For no reason other than that they might tell on us. <sighs> Doesn't really line up. You know, like it's just Okay. Um, and Micken says, what I don't understand is why Narvellan thought killing the slaves would prevent the Sachakans realizing we were here. Once their master returns home, it will be obvious something is wrong. And surely the Sachakans are going to notice a few hundred Kirelians riding through and camping in their land. Yes, Dakin agreed. I'm wondering why we ever thought we'd be able to sneak up on them. Or why those who should know better even suggested it. Do you think they said whatever they thought would get the army here, knowing that once we were here, we couldn't change our minds? Tessia asked. Neither Dakin nor Giant answered, but they didn't need to. Woo! And then Giant says, I think Lord Narvellan may be a little mad. And the king knows it and is letting him do what the rest of us might not. Like, this is how this shit starts, guys. Every single Nazi did not have to be some, like, hand, like, you know, rubbing their palms together, scheming about how they could make people suffer. They weren't all sadists. They weren't all horrifying monsters. There were just enough of horrifying monsters that nobody else stood up to. Like, that's all you need. You just need a couple people willing to do unthinkable shit and a large group of people too afraid of them to counter them. And that's it. That's literally it. That's the recipe. That's when I'm talking about cops. That's what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about ice, that's what I'm talking about. Like you don't need everybody to be a psychopath. You just need people to be afraid. Boom. And that's what's manifesting here. And it's really weird because Narvellan struck us all as readers and by us I'm talking also about like Tessia and Giant when they first met him he seemed like a really nice guy you know he was one of those people that just was like oh yeah they've been friends forever whatever this isn't somebody who as far as we know was out here like torturing animals in his spare time and it's weird how this sort of thing begins to manifest and it, it is part of what makes people so effective at like abusing other folks is that they can put on a really good show of being like a totally normal person. That is not to say that Narvellan is out here like with a dual personality necessarily. 
I don't see when he says that Narvellan's a little mad. I put that in a separate category from somebody who's like an abuser who cultivates a certain persona for the public while acting very differently behind closed doors. I don't feel like that's who Narvellan is. Narvellan seems to just be like almost a fanatic. Like they've decided that this is their path, their course of action. And Narvellan's just like, oh yeah, I'm fucking seriously committing to this shit, you know? Um, but I, I really find it interesting that he isn't, if you were going to try and like pick somebody out of this crowd, I don't feel like Narvellan was, is the one that we would have zeroed in on. Right. And I want to make sure Martin, you can correct me here if I'm wrong. Um, Narvellan is the first person, the first other magician that they meet when they leave the, like, where Dakin's territory ends, right? Narvellan is, like, his, his basically neighbor. Um, it's just, I don't know, it's an interesting development. So, Martin says, think so. Yeah, that's what I thought as well. So, yeah, I just, it would be so easy for this author to make this person who's doing this Somebody who has been really like cruel or dismissive or at least an asshole in some way, you know, earlier. And that way we'd be like, oh, well, we knew they were no good. But it doesn't necessarily have to go that way. It tends to. I mean, people who ha are like power hungry and who delight in like the suffering of others, they often are spottable. But not always. And it just makes it. We like to convince ourselves that it's something that we can easily see because it makes us feel like we have some control over it and it's not necessarily the case, you know. Um, so, yeah, this is just like really, it gets pretty intense. This whole conversation, it seems like they are all, like they don't turn around and ride away. I have to admit that I kind of thought that's what we were leading to was this crew crew of people abandoning this and being like, I'm sorry, I can't participate in this anymore. And instead they all seem to recognize that they have come too far at this point to turn around. I don't know that I agree with that. I don't really know what it looks like if they turn around. It all depends on how they, the remaining Kirillians fare as they continue to invade. So, you know, maybe Dakin and Giant and Tessia all like go back to his little area and begin to rebuild. And all of a sudden they find out that like every Kirillian magician is fucking dead. And everybody's like, wow, it's a good thing y'all didn't go. You were sure right about this. Or. They succeed, and then the king comes back and is like, you guys are traitors, and I'm going to hang every single one of you. Don't know. They could also, like, maybe uh, flee to Aline. Is there an extradition treaty set up between Aline and Curelia? I don't know. I don't know what I would have done in this situation. I like to think that I'd bail. But it's really easy to try and tell yourself in the moment when things like this are happening that... That's the one horrific thing we're going to do. And now that it's done, we can move forward and pretend that that's the end of it. It's not the end of it, like, ever. But, you know, we can say that to ourselves. And we have been as a country for, like, ever. So, um, so Hanara is hanging out with Takato, Asara, and Achito. Um, and by hanging out, I mean, he is standing in the background, watching them talk and just fucking fawning over Takato in his mind. There is a slave here, Asara, who gets the sense, um, or Asara's slave, sorry, who gets the sense that something is fucking up and Hanara totally dismisses her calls her a foolish woman in his head, like just totally not here for this. But it turns out that this woman is correct because they are fed scraps from the table and they 
begin to sort of get woozy. And he realizes that they have been drugged. Um, and I found this really interesting, like this conversation that's happening. Um, Takato is like explaining why they lost. And he's being really forthright about the fact that uh, the Kirelians have developed better methods of fighting. Um, and it would have been really easy for him to sort of lie about what happened or exaggerate or say like, oh, yeah, we pulled out voluntarily or whatever. But instead, he's being pretty honest with the fact that like, oh, yeah, we kind of underestimated them. They're actually more capable than we expected. And they put up quite a fight and we just wound up having a run. Also, this is one asshole who's dead now screwed up our timing and we might have been able to pull it out except for him. Um, so to, uh, Hanara gets like very sort of woozy here. Pat like begins to fall and then feels like fabric pulled over his head. And later on it is revealed that he has been kidnapped and brought to the emperor who is fully aware about what's going on with Takato and understands everything a lot fucking better than stupid trusting Hanara. It's amazing that Hanara can continue to see Takato the way that he does. But this is just such human nature. It's not even about Takato when it comes right down to it. This is about Hanara wanting to believe that he is part of something bigger, nobler, and that even though he is a slave, that he has some sort of like important role in this as well. This is about his own ego in a weird sort of secondhand way. And that's just something that we as human beings do is we, we like have devoted our lives to something, whether or not that is voluntary is kind of irrelevant. If we have invested a great deal of our lives into something specific, it is anathema to be told, oh yeah, that doesn't mean anything actually. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you invested all of your time in a person or a cause that is fundamentally either evil or hopelessly flawed or destructive, or whatever. Nobody wants to hear that, you know? So Hanara, he's a slave. He doesn't get to choose who he's serving. So what does he do? He makes this person that he has to serve into some sort of hero in his head. This is the way that he chooses to see things because it's probably a huge comfort to him. And really one would think that considering this guy enslaving him and you know, throwing away the lives of his other servants in front of Hanara with no concern about it at all during that battle, only keeping Hanara alive because he needs a source slave. You would think that Hanara would realize that this is not what a like, good man does, but he has to tell himself a story of some kind and make himself believe that like, oh no, he kept me alive because I'm the best out of everybody. I'm his most loyal servant. I'm the servant who predicts what he needs the most. I'm the most in tune with him. And so it's not merely an accident or coincidence that I was kept around. No, no, no. I earned this by my own actions. Because again, we just need to tell ourselves that. <sighs> Poor Hanara. So the king, or the emperor, reads Hanara's mind. And Hanara had been intending to go up there and like tell the emperor, I believe in what Takato is doing. He is working on behalf of Sachaka. He's only ever cared about Sachaka, but re like getting his mind read on purpose did not actually occur to him. It doesn't seem, which I find kind of surprising because like mind reading just seems to be the thing to do with, especially in Sachaka. It's something that you can like impose upon somebody much more easily than you can in Kirelia. And by easily, I mean, it's more culturally acceptable 
that you subject people to forced mind reading in Sachaka. So it's weird that it doesn't even enter his head that that's what they're going to do to him. But sure enough, he comes in and the emperor is just like, come here, and puts his hands on either side of his head. And this leads to a really heartbreaking conversation in which the emperor sees the way that Hanara sees Takato, sees the loyalty, the admiration, the feeling of long life keeps coming up as well because of Hanara, like really believing that there's something that will withstand the test of time about his like participation in all of this, really feeling like he accomplished something. And the emperor comes back at him and is just like, Hey, so they were our allies and now they're invading. They may win. And even if they don't, there is absolutely no reason for them to ever trust us as a country ever, ever again. So you're out here talking about how much Takato cared about Sachaka and how he was doing all of this for Sachaka. Well, let me tell you that he is actually the one that has doomed us all. And that if this country falls, it will be entirely on his shoulders for deciding to go ahead and do something without my permission without talking to me about it. And we had a, a, you know, a tenuous alliance. And at one point, Hanara thinks to himself, like, yeah, well, why didn't you talk to him about the alliance? And then he wouldn't have done this. And the emperor is like, do you really think that's true? Do you really believe that if I had talked this over with him and tried to explain, he would ever have listened to me? And not just done what the fuck he was going to do anyway. And Hanara tries to like, you know, keep the thought from his head. But he immediately can't help but formulate the word no. He knows Takato gon do what Takato gon do. This isn't about Sachaka. This isn't about what's right. This isn't about trying to find glory for literally anybody but himself. Takato is for Takato, the end. And Hanara is just kind of broken by this revelation, by this realization that this man that he has been admiring, who he has been assigning all of these like motives is actually just like a selfish power hungry douchebag who doesn't care about anything. Like this is just completely about his own, his own grab at land and wealth and power and really wanting to break away from Sachaka. Takato wanted to be able to get out from under the emperor's thumb is really the truth of the matter. So it's a pretty sad moment, actually, like when Hanara realizes all of this. It's just, I really feel for him because, like I said, it is just such human nature for us to tell ourselves stories. We just need to get through the day. And we tell ourselves stories even when we're in pretty decent circumstances. So imagine the kinds of stories you have to tell yourself when you're in the kind of circumstance that Hanara is in. Of course, they have to be borderline unbelievable and really exaggerated to be able to get you through. What else can you say about the, like, how else do you convince yourself that there's a reason to keep living? Unless you convince yourself that there is a greater purpose behind what you're doing. You know, if all of your free will has been taken from you, it's, you know, it's just, you're not left with a lot of options other than to believe that there's like some sort of great fate to everything. So anyway, that's the deal with the emperor. Um, And let's talk about what's going on here. So. The color lit the edges of faces and re- was reflected in eyes, giving familiar figures a strangeness somewhat appropriate, Dakin thought, after the deeds of the night. People he thought he knew, whom he'd believed of gentler character, had shown a darker side, or a weakness for copying what the majority did, though they did not agree with it. The king had decided that Narvellan would lead every attack on the Sachakan estates, but that each time he should take a different group of magicians. 
An interesting decision, Dagan had thought. He's forcing us all to take part in the slaughter, so the responsibility is spread among us. If we all feel guilty, none of us is going to start blaming others. Dakin was wondering what would happen when it was his turn, and he refused to participate. So far, there had been no shortage of volunteers. Lord Prinnan had joined the third group, confessing to Dakin beforehand that he feared if he did not strengthen himself, he would be useless in the battles to come. You could leave them exhausted instead, Tessia had suggested, no doubt realizing what his refusal to participate might mean. And Narvellum will check afterwards and ensure they are dead, he replied. Don't worry, it's only a matter of waiting. Once the king realizes that we can't possibly keep our presence in Sachaka a secret, he won't care if we let the slaves live or not. Which I feel like is very wishful thinking. It again comes down to vengeance. It's not about practicality. They're lying about that part. So when it becomes impractical, it's irrelevant. That's not going to be the deciding factor. Um, so to, 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 um, the king is talking about, he says, we need a safe place to camp. Um, mag magician Sabin suggests we ride on in daylight. Your majesty, he can asks, won't we be seen? The king nodded. What we have done this night will eventually be discovered perhaps in a day or two, but we should assume we aren't so lucky and that the news of our arrival began to travel after our first stop. We should keep moving. We may not be able to keep pace with news of ourselves, but for a while we may arrive too soon for our enemy to prepare to meet or avoid us. Um, and at this point, Sabin says, when once the news has outpaced us, we'll find a defensible position and take turns resting. So they're basically like going to push it until... They come up against a bunch of Shachakins, essentially. It's not like too deep a plan. Um, and would we be more successful at keeping pace with the news if we did not stop to attack the Sachakin homes along the way? Dakin asks. We would, Sabin said, but we need to strengthen ourselves as well. But we have the store stone, Dakin pointed out. Sabin glanced at Demiend, which we should not use unless we absolutely have to. It would be a waste if we used it, but still failed because we had not gone to the effort of seeing to our own strength. At this, the Dem's lips twitched, but he said nothing. Now, I confess I didn't really understand the significance of this moment, but later on, I believe it's Dakin who's like thinking back on it. Um, and he says that he believes they are too proud to use the store stone because it's from Eileen and it's one of their ideas. And so they just don't like, they would rather murder and like steal strength than use something freely given to them simply because it would essentially be accepting help from the other country, which is really fucked up. Um, and, he says, not that anything I say will make a difference. They want to give us the best chance of winning. The lives of a few thousand slaves aren't going to seem so important next to that. Again, a few thousand. Like, they are just doing the exact same kind of damage this, that the Sachakins did. And they're just putting a different coat of paint on it. Um, so then we get Dakin, and he is assigned to go collect food. Um, and rather than like participate in the slaughter and the king talks to him about it and is like, so you don't agree with this. And the king is like, look, I understand you said something about how you didn't want us to become Sachakins. I don't think we're in danger of that. I hope you are right. Dakin glanced at Narvellan deliberately. The king's eyes flashed. So do I. But the decision is made and I must stick to it. I will not make you join the attacks, but I can't be seen to accept your refusal too easily. Fortunately, all who have noticed it have said that it is not in your nature, and remaining weaker is penalty enough. They are more worried about you than angry. So, I am then put in this like awkward position as a reader, where I have to believe that Dakin is the only one out of all of these magicians who has expressed any kind of uncertainty 
about this who has expressed any doubt or desire to not participate. And I don't really buy that. I have no doubt that the majority would go along to get along because they're not only not wanting to be like uh, seen as traitors or at the very least as like weak, but they also are getting something out of it. They are getting strength from it. They are getting magic from it. So I have no problem believing the majority would do it, but I do have a problem believing that Deacon's literally the only one who's like, what? No, this isn't cool. Like, that just feels a little bit unlikely to me. However, for the sake of this, I'll go with it. Um, so, let's see. So, Narvellen, um, they come across this, like, huge store of food. Narvellen comes across, um, comes over and like tells Dakin, Hey, I know you were in charge of collecting the food. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in here for some reason that like storehouse is full, even though the place is practically empty. Um, and there's a weird moment, a couple of weird moments. Every time Narvellen comes and talks to Dakin, it feels really awkward because like, Dakin is trying to pretend that he's not repulsed by this guy and Narvellen doesn't seem completely aware of exactly how much his, like, I don't, I'm not sure about this, but it feels like Narvellen doesn't quite get exactly how much it's over between them in terms of being friends anymore. But at one point he comes over and is like, people are starting to talk about the fact that you weren't taking any power. And they're like claiming that, uh, that I, I forget what he even says. He says something like that you killed people because like there winds up being poison in some of the food and some people get really sick. And he tries to be like, they're claiming that you were mad about the fact that we were killing slaves. And so you decided to poison some of our own out of protest. To which Dakin's like, oh, okay, so I had a problem with killing people. And because of that, I decided that I would kill people. That makes a lot of sense. Good call. And it's one of those, like, Narvellan's presenting it like people are saying. I don't buy it. I don't think people are saying anything. I think Narvellan's spreading some shit around. I think Narvellan is realizing that Dakin is not bored anymore and is starting to, like, kind of create an insurance policy for himself and instill doubt about Dakin's own loyalties so that at some point, if Dakin speaks up against things, he can be like, oh yeah, but uh, you guys all know that this guy probably poisoned those guys, right? And that will have been percolating in gossip for a couple of days and people will start to sort of side with, I mean, they're going to side with the person who's got the ear of the king and who is like leading the charge. It's just natural. So... Yeah, it's just a shame. The the whole way this goes down and the conversations between him and Narvellan. Yikes. Um, so the magicians, like, they, they start to notice that um, there are fewer corpses in some of the places that they begin to come upon and that there are really beautiful clothes in storage, which leads them to realize that, like, Okay, so there are probably magicians living here, or at least, like, you know, nobles, and they have evacuated, and they've left stuff behind. So it is kind of official now. This means that they know we're coming. We're not taking them by surprise anymore. Um, they go into the storehouse and begin to take a lot of the food out of there, and there's one giant jar. Um... And he opens, Dakin opens the jar and it's just like, man, I wish that we had some smaller jars we could put st uh, uh, stuff in and like closes it and acts really weird. And it turns out that the jar doesn't have, it's not a regular jar. It doesn't have a bottom and it goes down into like an, uh sort of root cellar and there are a bunch of people in there. Um, and it's, I think, mostly women, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but they don't turn these folks in. And it later on is, uh, he is recognized by some of the people 
as being the one that let them escape. But it is a little bit late because he gets like sent flying by Stara into a like wall hook for a lamp to hang, I think. So he's pretty injured. It, I don't know that he's going to die from his injury because um, he has Tessia with him and she's been working on her healing skills. So it might wind up like he, she practices some new magic um, medicine and manages to heal him. But uh, yeah, this is a pretty interesting moment. So speaking of, I'm running out of time here. But there's not quite 30, um, there's like 30 pages rather than 50 in the final section of this book. So I think I'll be able to talk about part of this next time as well. Um, Stara finds out, first of all, that her husband is indeed gay. So that's the first thing. And he is like in love with the map maker who winds up dead. And it's really rather sad. Um it is still weird to me that he's like, do you think he's good looking? I don't mind if you think he's good looking. Like he's, he's saying this about a guy that he's into to his wife. What a weird moment. Um, but Stara and the other women, the other traitors are gathering as many women who have fled as they can in order to go to a safe area. And she is able to, like, she remembers that they had talked about it, her and the map maker, when she was looking at his work. Um, and she only finds out, finds out that her husband is, was in love with the guy because she goes to the map maker's house in order to try and break in and find the map to the spot that she's intending to take everybody to hide and comes across him cradling the map maker in his lap crying. And it's like, oh, it's really, really sad. I feel so bad for the guy. And uh, she has to like, let him know, buddy, I know you're gay. And like, I'm not mad at you because in Eileen, dudes can sleep with dudes and nobody really cares. Like there's occasional people who are dicks about it, but like they're dicks to everybody. So what are you going to do? However, it's fucked up that you married me knowing that you weren't going to have a kid with me. And that was like the whole reason that I agreed to do this. Um, so he kind of just sort of agrees to step out of the way and let all of, a lot of the women come and stay at Sarah's home at first um, until they realize that like the Kirillians are coming closer and they really need to move. They need to get the fuck out. Um, and then he, steps out of the way so that Stara can lead all of these folks out of the city and into the uh, sanctuary in the mountains that she intends for. And she says something like about how all of these amazing women heading out into the sanctuary uh, f and starting a new place where it's like a more just equal society is some sort of how she's thinking to herself. And I'm just like, I thought that you just temporarily were going out there and then you would come back. Are you all just like really like taking off and like staying gone? Because that's a whole other thing. And I'm not really sure I'm reading that properly. Martin asks, how much is left of this book? Uh, yeah, I stopped at page 555 and it says that there are 583 pages. So just over 30 pages, and that's including like glossary and acknowledgments. So very, not too much left. Um, but I feel like I pretty much covered the majority of what happens this section. Um, oh, you know what I didn't talk about? But I will save this for later. Um, is Tessia dealing with the poison, which is pretty interesting. Um, and I like the fact that she manages to do it. She doesn't think she can. And then once she like really focuses and gets up in there, she starts to be like, oh, oh, I could pull it out. No shit. And it's kind of fun. Um, I kind of like this development, but I don't feel like I'm going to get to do it justice here. So I'm going to wait. Last episode, we'll talk about that and like overall impressions. Um, 
Martin says, has Ashley said what she wants to do with the last two commissioned episodes, Start Trader Spy Trilogy? No idea, Martin. Hopefully she will get in touch with me once she gets a chance to watch this. I didn't know that there were supposed to be two more episodes commissioned. Um, yeah, I hadn't checked that. But unless she wanted there to be like a live read of the last chapters, um, which is possible. But do, 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 let's see if I can find that section. But um, yeah, that'll frequently happen. People will commission past the point when something would actually be over and done with. Um, boop, boop, boop. Black Magicians. Here we go. Uh, Magician's Apprentice. So yeah, this is what's today, the third. So yeah, there's two more, but neither of them is Voyeur. So I'm not sure. You'll have to, uh, you'll have to ask her. You could reach out on the Spoil Me page, probably on Facebook. Um, but maybe I will start the next one. I don't know what she, what her plan is, or maybe she just wanted like a wrap up episode. I had a couple people ask for that on other stuff. So perhaps that's it. Um, but yeah. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to wrap. Thank you again so much for listening. Thank you to Martin for hanging out with me in the chat. Thank you to Ashley for commissioning this. And hopefully I will have uh, done this justice. And I'll see you soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.